I want to talk to you about tonight about the consequences of not trusting God. The consequences of not trusting God. I want you to keep your Bible open to the 12th chapter of Genesis. Genesis, the 12th chapter, and leave it open on your lap, please. At Times Square Church, from now on, we'll not say if you have your Bibles, because we know you have your Bibles. <clears throat> chapter... 12. Just leave it there because that's where I'm going to be preaching from tonight. The consequences of not trusting God. Lord, it's been a good day. It's been a wonderful day in your presence. I give you thanks. We give you thanks. Holy Spirit, now we come to the word. How we love your word. How we yearn for your word to change us and to mold us into your image, Jesus. Lord, there's nothing, nothing that touches us more than your word. Jesus, you are the word. This is the living Christ. We glorify you, Lord. We magnify you tonight. And I acknowledge my need of your anointing. I can't preach this in my own strength or power. I give it to you, Lord. We take authority over every demon power, over principality, and power of darkness. We pray, Lord, you give us a hearing ear and let this word flow out of my heart as you caused it to flow into my heart. Sanctify this vessel, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to make a statement that may offend some of you, but I believe it to be the truth. <clears throat> With all the talk today about faith and all the books and the tapes, the teaching and the preaching, I believe this is one of the most untrusting generations of all time. With all our training books, everything we have preached and taught about faith, we have had more written and taught about faith than any generation, but we are the most untrusting of all, I believe, in history. We talk faith, we preach it, we sing about it. And in good times, that may be all right. That may suffice for a season. But when really hard times, we don't have often what it takes. <clears throat> like the children of Israel, we cry, God, where are you? We, we come to church, we sing, God can make a way. I'm glad you sang it because it's in my message. <laughs> but then we get in a hard time and say, well, Lord, where's the way? We, we, we start questioning, God, where? Where am I? Where are you? And we fail when the real test of the difficult times comes upon us. The Bible says the just shall live by faith. Now, that's not just for eternal salvation. That means your daily life. That means everything that you are and everything that you do in life, you are going to live by faith. And folks, there are times that are coming going to be so hard, so difficult, so calamitous, you're going to live by faith. You will not be able to afford doctors. You're going to live by faith. It, it, the time is coming that this scripture will be more than just something we read and forget about it. The just or the righteous shall live by faith. Jude, speaking of those living in the last days, said this, Beloved, build up your, yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. He said, it's time to build yourself up here in the last day. Build up your faith because you're going to need it in this hour. Oh, beloved, this is not a time for wavering faith. Not at all. In Psalms 22, David said of our spiritual fathers, Our fathers trusted in thee, Lord. They trusted and you did deliver them. They cried unto thee and they were delivered. They trusted in you. And they were not confounded. Our fathers lived by faith. Our fathers believed that you would keep your word. They were never confused and they were not confounded. God made a way for our fathers. And one of the fathers that David is speaking about was Father Abraham. Bible says that Father Abraham, he staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief. But was strong in faith giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. Now, God has set before us an example of a man 
who the Bible says was not weak in faith. He never staggered the promises of God once he came into full faith. Now, he didn't come into full faith until he got his faith name Abraham. He was called Abram up to the time his faith was being grounded and tested. And I want to take you on a little trip with me tonight and talk a little bit about faith. We'd like to have this kind of faith that's described here as belonging to Father Abraham. Not weak, not wavering, fully persuaded, all doubts that are conquered. But folks, that kind of faith does not come easy. That kind of faith comes only through failure after failure, test after test. And that's what my message is about tonight. First Peter 1 7, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, don't be tried by fire, may be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Folks, our faith is going to go into the fire. We are about to go into the fire. I told you from this pulpit of, uh, a few months ago, in fact, uh, probably four or five weeks ago, when the stock market was way down, uh, almost 15%, I said it's going to go back up again. There's going to be a phony uh, rise. It's going to be a manipulated market. It's going to be a false market. And that's where we are, just as, just as we, we talked about from this pulpit. But folks, watch out. We are headed for the fire, and it's going to come. But the Bible says out of that are going to come a people with a tested, tried faith, there's going to be unshakable, unmovable, who are kept by the power of God through faith to salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In the last time, God is going to reveal a body of people, a body of Christ that has an absolutely unshakable faith. They're going to live by faith, and their example of living by faith, living without fear, is going to be a testimony to the whole ungodly world. Tested faith, tried faith coming forth as gold. Now, Abraham, Abram was a good and righteous man. Here's a man that takes a, a journey of faith. God calls him to a walk of faith. He started out with just a simple, trusting obedience in the Lord. The Lord came to him and said, and let me read to you from verse 1, chapter 12. Look at verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show you. Folks, this is, look at me now. This is where faith begins. This is where the little germ of faith begins. A call to abandon oneself into the hands of God. The whole future, just total abandonment to the will of God. Faith has to begin there. This man is called to take a journey. Now, he doesn't know where he's going. He's not told about the hardships he's going to face on the way. He's not told what he's to expect when he gets there. He's told simply to get out of his comfort zone and take a leap of faith in the arms of his heavenly father. And he says, I want you to just pick up everything. Now, th th this is a step of faith for this man because he's got children, he's got family, he's got relatives, he's got a cattle business. This man's got to pull up stakes, he's got to pull up everything, and he's going to go out to the unknown. He's going to go out and head 300 miles into a desert. Hot sun, snakes, water animals. He had uh, no idea where he's going. Now, folks, that's faith. That's where it begins. Where, where you take a leap into the arms of your heavenly father. You look into the arms of Jesus. And Jesus has made that call to all of us. He says, the just shall live by faith. That's the call Abram got. Right. You take a leap of faith into the arms of the Lord and say, I commit my life. He says, he says, come and follow me. Put your life in my hands is what he said to Abram. Abram, pick yourself up from your comfort zone. You've had it nice. Now I'm going to ask you to go out into the unknown. Totally unknown. God told him, out of your loins will come a great nation. <clears throat> I'm going to bless you, Abram. I'm going to make you great. You're going, you're going to be a great blessing. Now, folks, you've got to understand the magnificence of what God was saying, the importance of this statement that he's just made to Abram. 
He said, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed by you. Now, folks, he's not talking about Abraham himself, but his seed. He's talking about Christ. He's talking about Jesus. The whole world is going to be blessed by the seed that comes out of your very loins. This points to Jesus Christ. He's saying to Abraham, I'm going to make you the father of a new race. A new kind of people that I've been looking for from the very beginning of creation. He's seen the sin and the debauchery and had to do away with the whole race other than Noah. No, he says, I want a race that's going to walk by faith. I have to have a man who walks by faith. And I'm calling you to myself to abandon yourself to me. And folks, he's talking about, he's, he, he's, he's laying a foundation for a new race. A people who will walk blindly by faith. Because you see what is coming is going to have to, he's going to have to believe. He's going to have to have faith. He's going to have to believe in the impossible. Because there's going to be a child born to a man who's no longer fertile into a womb that is already dead. And the seed is speaking about an immaculate conception, an absolute impossibility. He's talking about the coming people of God, the race that he's going to raise up named Israel. And God's talking about the impossible things are going to happen going to be a red sea that opens and people walk on dry ground he's talking about bread falling out of heaven angels food falling out of heaven he's talking about water coming out of a rock he's talking about impossible humanly impossible things a whole race who believes and sees the impossible how can He'd be the father of a race of believing God for the impossible unless he has that kind of faith. He went out. Now, here's the definition of faith as far as I'm concerned. Here's the definition of the beginning of faith. Where, here's the seed of faith. And he went out not knowing where he's going. He went out not knowing where he's going. <clears throat> I've been there. He's saying, Lord, I'm stepping out. He takes this step. He says, I am stepping out in faith now. I lay down all my own ideas of how I'm supposed to live. I'm not going to try to work out my own blessings. I'm not going to try to how to lead my family my own way. I'm not going to try to provide my own living by my own wits. Lord, I'm going to put everything in your hands. I'm going to go to fully trusting your leadership. Lord, you're calling every shot from now on. I lay it all down. You told me to pick up and just follow you. You said you'd lead me. You'd guide me every day. All right. He, he abandons himself into the hands of God and he sets out on this journey. He's 75 years old. His wife is in her 60s. She's a beautiful woman in her 60s. <laughs> Just like my wife. Score one for the preacher. <laughs> don't, don't try to tell Abram that faith is easy. Don't go to him and say, yeah, explain faith to me. Just like we do today. Explain faith to me, Abraham. Uh, give me your theology on faith. You see, that's our preoccupation today in the church. We dissect it. We analyze the word. We go to the Greek. We go to the Hebrew. We write books and we study it. Abraham have nothing to do with that. Abram simply say faith is simply trusting your life, your future fully into the hand and care of the Heavenly Father. And obedience 
to a call to yield my life fully into his hands. That just so lived by faith, he went out not knowing where he went. All right? Uh, you can check your map. It was about a 300-mile trip, and it was a rough trip, no doubt. There, there were few watering holes. There were all kinds of... There were hot sun beating upon him. And he, he finally gets to a, a wilderness, <clears throat> an abandoned, awful-looking wilderness called Canaan. And the Lord stops him. Now, what do you get when you set out to walk by faith? Say, I'm going to give everything in the hands of God. I'm not going to call the shots. I'm going to pray and trust God to lead me the rest of my life. I'm going to obey Him. I'm going to love Him. I'm going to be intimate with Him. I'm going to get into His Word. I'm going to seek Him as never before. What does it get you? <laughs> She's right. You know what he got? A famine. A severe famine. God says, Abram, this is the land that I have promised you. There are no trees now. Everything is withered. There's no water for the cattle. There's no pasture. There's nothing. And God said, it's all yours. Every way you put your foot is yours. And he's thinking, I don't want it. Uh, we, we know he's thinking that because of what he did next. He built an altar, and I can tell you, knowing human nature, know what he did next. You know what he's praying. Lord, I don't understand this. I, I have walked in holiness before you. I have built an altar. I'm a worshiper. I'm intimate with you. He's called a friend of God. He has intimacy. He walks with God. He's in righteousness. He's in total obedience to the Lord. He's doing exactly what God tells him to do. And he winds up in a severe famine. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's looking around and he's saying to his wife, I must have heard the wrong voice. We can't eat here. There's nothing here. There, there, there's no food. We have children. Lot was with him and his family. He had servants. He had, he had all this cattle, his, this a range full of cattle. And he said, what are we going to do? The famine was grievous in the land, it says. Have you ever prayed that? He said, Lord, never in my life have I obeyed you more than I have now. I've been in your word. I've loved you. I've walked by faith the best I know how. And such, you're face to face with a crisis. And you, God says, I'm leading you and finding when you get to the place where the Lord just says, stop. And then suddenly you are face to face with an absolutely impossible situation. There's trouble. There's, there's, there's a crisis right in front of you. And, and this man must be thinking, did I, did I miss it somewhere? Did I, I get out of his will? Did I listen to the wrong voice? How, how can a dry, barren, unfulfilling place be a reward for obedience? After all I've desired after you, Lord, how could I end up in a famine? How many of you here tonight, right now, in this building, at this very place, you know that you love God with all your heart? And you've been faithful to him. And after all your fasting and all your praying and your devotion to the Lord, your cry for holiness, you're being led into a crisis. And it doesn't make sense. It seems contrary to everything you know about the Lord and his leading. Now, let me give you a ex few examples of that. Here's... Uh, Someone that's been praying for a, a better paying job and, and believing God and through prayer, God opens it and you get that better paying job and, and you, you, you begin to thank him. Thank you, Lord. You've been so faithful. You are leading me. It does pay to pray and read the word. Look, God's given me this wonderful job. 
Two weeks later, the company downsizes and the, the last hired first fired. <laughs> and suddenly you're out without a job. Face to face with a crisis. What about that telephone call that somebody gets from someone close to them in the family and there's somebody hysterical on the other the line and says, I, I don't know how to tell you, but I have cancer, inoperable cancer, and I've been given six months to live. And, and you say, wait a minute, that's my family. And I've been walking in covenant with God, and I've been praying, I've been fasting, I've been seeking the Lord, and now I'm led into this. Is this the reward for faithfulness? The story, there, there's a young lady who prayed and prayed for God to bring somebody into her life, a spiritual man, because she wasn't lusting or anything else, but she had spent a lot of time being faithful to the Lord, and she knew God would answer, and she met a spiritual young man, and that young man, and she seemed to be get, that seemed to be so right, and she felt good about it, she thought this was the answer to her prayer. He just walks away one day and gives no explanation, he says, I don't care anymore. You can be holy, obedient, devoted, walking in faith, walking in the measure of faith God is led, give you, and be led by God right into the test of your life. He was led by God to this severe famine. It was God's leading. It wasn't the devil. All right. You ready for the next step? Whatever measure of faith Abram had up to this time, it still lacked a dimension. And many of us are lacking this dimension. God led him into a crisis that demanded an even bigger leap of faith. He had to take a leap of faith to leave everybody, everything, and make the decision to commit his life and his future and his direction to the hands of the Lord. To take directions from the Lord. And to totally yield his family, his future, and everything into the hands of God. And now God has brought him into a situation that demanded another leap of faith. God has brought Abram now to a place where he was going to bring Israel to the rim of the Red Sea. Where it was humanly impossible to be delivered outside of a miracle. Abraham had been led into a place where his very life is now at stake. The life of his family, his children, all of those people with him. Nothing to eat, no way to survive. Do you remember what the devil said about Job? The devil said, skin for skin, all that a man has will he give for his life. But you put forth your hand now, you touch his bone and you touch his flesh, and he'll curse you to your face. And that's the same accusation the devil flings at God concerning every one of his children today. He said, oh, yeah, God, your brother, your sister, that child of yours, they'll serve you until you touch their belly. You start putting them in a hard place. You bring a depression. You bring hard times. And when there's no food in the belly and they feel their hunger pains, they feel pain and they're in a hard time. And you, you allow some crisis to come into their life, they'll turn on you and curse your face, God. That's still the accusation from the pits of hell. Abram is brought to a place. He's either got to move into the miraculous and believe God for the impossible or take matters in his own hands. And folks, that's why God brings us to this point. To see whether you're going to absolutely believe Him to be the miraculous God of the impossible. Or you're going to take matters into your own hands and do it your way in the flesh. Did Abraham pass the test? No, he miserably, miserably failed. And Abraham went down to Egypt to sojourn. He wasn't willing to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. He's not ready to take that leap of faith into believing that God can do the impossible. You know what David said about people in a famine? He said, God delivers his people from death and he keeps them alive in famine. 
David said, now this, this is later, but see, this is the heart of God. David was revealing. It was always the heart of God. In the days of famine, they shall be satisfied or they shall be fed in the days of famine. In fact, a hundred years later, his own son Isaac is in another famine. And the Bible says there was a famine in the land. And you'll find this Genesis 26 chapter. This is a hundred years later. This is his son, Isaac. There was a famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And the Lord appeared unto Isaac and said, do not go down to Egypt. God said to Isaac, if you'll just stay here, I'll feed you, I'll take care of you. And God does that. God fed him, God kept him through the famine. He learned to hold on by faith. But you see, Abram, faith began to shake. <clears throat> you see, faith begins with a total abandon of oneself into God's hands. But faith is never passive. But it's always active. There must be full confidence that God can and will do the absolute impossible. The impossible. Jesus said with God, all things are possible. And in Luke 1, 37, for with God, nothing, nothing. Say it, folks. Nothing shall be impossible. Nothing shall be impossible. Faith says God's enough. God's enough. See, the Lord here is making a man of faith. He's trying to make a man of faith. He's, he's led this man into a hopeless crisis now, hoping he'll just give up all human thinking and say, God, live or die. You sent me here. You have been leading me. I've been living by your word. I've been living honestly before you. Take over. Live or die, I'm the Lord's. That's what God wanted. God wanted totally. Lord, here I am. If I have to sit here and die, I'll die in your will. I'm not moving. I'm going to stand still and see the salvation of God. Folks, there's, listen to me now, there's no greater peace on the face of the earth than to trust God for everything in everything. There's no greater peace than to have had, to have absolutely abandoned yourself to faith in God's power to do the impossible when you've given up control of everything in your life to Him. Fear and doubt overwhelmed Abram and now he's crying, Lord, get me out of this. Get me out of here. But you see, the truth is, faith is not meant to get you out of a hard place. But to change your heart in the hard place. It's not about changing your condition, it's about changing you and changing me. God most likely is not going to change any of our circumstances. Occasionally he does. But you see... If, if you are not changed, if God just plucks you out of it, you have not learned to trust him. You've not learned the lesson at all. You've not really learned the grace of faith at all. You see, the Hebrew children met Jesus in the furnace. Daniel saw the grace of deliverance in the lion's den. If he'd have been suddenly pulled out, he would never known the miracle. He'd have never seen the miracle. He would have never had a faith built on knowing that God does the impossible. Jesus, remember, is in the back of the boat when the storm hit the disciples' boat? And in panic, they wake him up and said, Master, don't you care that we're about to drown? Jesus is fast asleep. The wind is blowing, howling, the waves... Water coming into the boat, and Jesus is fast asleep. Probably a beatifical smile on his face. <laughs> Jesus is awakened, and he stands up and says, Peace. The wind stops. The rain. Everything. There's a calm. And they say, What kind of man is this? And they're marveling at this great miracle, but they missed the biggest miracle of all. They, they missed the greatest evidence of faith. 
They missed their own miracle. The miracle was the man asleep in the storm. There's the testimony of some so resting in the hands of God. He's committed everything to the Lord. He knows God's made him a promise that he's going to be redeemed of the world. He knows the devil can't kill him. Folks, I'm the devil can't kill you. Since I've been in New York, my life's been threatened at least five times. And I walked this, or occasionally, I used to look back once in a while, but. <laughs> I, I know the devil can't kill me in this. God has some re, God would have to have a reason for it. And I can't think of one right now. <laughs> Don't you offer me one either. <laughs> you see, it's it's the person that's it, it's so absolutely yielded into the hands of the Father by faith, like the sleep of faith. My God can do the impossible. If if if, if I'm out of my job, if I'm out of job, my God knows that He's going to take care of me, and being able to go to sleep at night and just rest. It's not the Francis gets up and says. And everything's all right. And zap you out of your problem. No, 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 no. It's the Christian that can come into the house of God, walks the streets and everywhere else with the total peace of God. My God can do the impossible. He, my God's a deliverer. God's going to keep me. Hallelujah. The miracle was the man sleeping in the storm. God wants us to be able to sleep. Uh, I mean, the peace of God rest through the coming storms, whatever crisis it may be. Hallelujah. Going down to Egypt is just saying, Lord, I'll take it from here. That's all it means. Lord, and, and, and you know what, you know what going down to Egypt means? It's the flesh presuming that it's made a mistake, heard the wrong voice, and going to straighten it out. I'm going to straighten it out. I, I miss God, so I've got to go back and make it right, and maybe I can hear better the next time. And that, that person usually doubts then everything God ever said to him. And Abram leaves the path of faith, and he gathers his brood together, and he says, we're getting out of here. We can't make it here. I don't know how I got sidetracked. I must have heard the wrong voice. Now, the good news is that Faith, strong faith, comes often through failure. But I'll tell you, there are consequences when we leave the path of faith and we move into the flesh. Those who operate in the flesh are going to pay some pretty awful consequences. Let me go over just a few of them. First of all, when, when you get, leave the path of faith... And don't just commit it all to the Lord. Lay every burden on him. So I'm not handling this, Lord. It's yours. I'm not going to try to step at night and figure it out. I'm not going to do anything. It's yours. I'm going to pray and trust you. I know you're leading me. You take over. You get a call from somebody in the family and unload problems on you. You just say, Lord, that's your problem. I'm going to seek you. I'm going to worship you. That's your problem. I'm not taking it. You, if you're going to keep taking all these problems on you, you're not going to be able to walk in faith. But you see, the, the, the number one consequence of leaving the path of faith and moving in the flesh is that you're going to have to start scheming and manipulating to survive. Abraham, Abram concocts a scheme for survival. He, he knows that these Egyptians are full of lust and that, that uh, they, they, they had something uh, of a lust toward fair... Uh, Fair women, fair complected women, and uh, he, he strikes it, he, he concocts a scheme. He said, now look, you're a very beautiful woman. <clears throat> Boy, at 60, I like to, like I said, I like to know what kind of face cream she uses. <laughs> I'm not trying to be facetious, but man, that, this, it, it, you look at this story. She's in her 60s, and Abraham's telling his, his wife, these men are going to lust after you. They're going to go after you, and, and, and they're going to kill me, thinking, or seeing me as your husband. So 
if you don't mind, to save my life, I want you to tell a white lie. I want you to tell them we're a brother and sister. That way, I'll not be killed. Those who walk in flesh are very self-centered and very selfish. Because they're not trusting in God. It's always me taking, look, looking out for number one. And so uh, she must have a great love for this man to do this. What a great love she must have had for Abram, her, her husband. But you see, the, the man or the woman who trusts in God, believing the Lord for protection and for the impossible, doesn't need any human resources. They don't need to make excuses. They never have to manipulate. They don't have to have a personal agenda because they're totally surrendered to the will and the purposes of God and leave the results to him. But see, Abram is not at this point yet. He'll get there eventually and become the father of faith because faith is coming out of failure now. God's building something. So if, if you've had your faith faltering and you've failed a lot, take heart. God's building something in you. David, remember, ran from Saul rather than to stay in the land and trust God who'd already delivered him from a bear, a giant, a lion, and a whole host of enemy Philistines. God had already proven himself, and God had already told this man that he, God would be his shield to all those who trust in him. He'd written this already, and, and yet he runs at the first threat from Saul, and he runs down to Gath. And the king of Gath finds out that David is in the camp. And he says, go get him. His soldiers get him. And the word gets, David, you're going to be killed. You're going to be assassinated because what you did to their giant. And David panics. He's now in enemy territory. He's running. He's in the flesh now. He's not trusting God with his life and his future. And now he's in the flesh. He's doing things his own way. And he gets in a mess. He's manipulating now. He's got to do something he never thought he would ever do. He pretends he's insane. He starts babbling like a moron. Spittles running down his beard and he's clawing at everybody. A man of God. I can see his soldiers go, oh my. King of Israel. He's praying like a madman because you see, when you're not walking in faith, you have to pretend you're something you're not. And do things that you'd never do. You have to manipulate, you have to scheme. And David's manipulating, he's scheming, and they bring him to the king, and he's wallowing on the floor, he's spitting, he's acting like a crazy man. And King of Gaza, get him out of here. What do I want to do with a madman? When we don't trust God and take matters in our own hands, we come just the same place where we have to try to be something we're not. Jacob did the same thing with his mother, Rebecca. All his life he had to be taught by Rebecca what God told her when these two boys were still in her womb that the elder would serve the younger. She had a promise that the birthright belonged to Jacob and they waited for years and it didn't happen and Rebecca gets uh, nervous about it. She can't wait. She loses her faith and so does Jacob. And so he tries to be somebody else. Pretends his own brother. He becomes a deceiver. You remember the story how the mother wrapped wool on his arms to mock, to say that he's his hairy, bro hairy brother. You see the manipulation and the scheming and being somebody you really aren't. And I would tell you, it took Jacob 20 years to get back on track to the faith walk. 20 years scheming till he came back to faith. Because you see, when you get in the flesh and get away from trusting God and obeying Him His way, you're going to thwart the purposes of God and you're going to have to go into another task that is even worse. Uh, 
Another consequence of not fully trusting God is that we literally put other people's lives at risk. We mess up other people by our unbelief. <clears throat> Abram really put his wife's life at risk. Sure enough, the princes of Pharaoh see her and get the word to <clears throat> Pharaoh. One of the historians said that Pharaoh had already sent uh, a contingent of his army to another nation where he had found word that there was a beautiful woman and he had killed a whole lot of people just to get this woman. And, and I don't know if Abraham was aware of that or not. But sure enough, word comes and she is taken because she's, they ask, is this your wife? He said, no, this is my sister. Is he your husband? No, this is my brother. A half truth. He just hid the truth, the full truth. We're used to that today, from the White House on down. <laughs> Human nature never changed, has it? And uh, so she's taken away into Pharaoh's harem. You understand the risk that this man took? This man has been given a promise that out of his loins would come. Really, is the Redeemer that all men shall be blessed. And some, I believe, Abram knew that. Because about Jesus, it's later said Abram saw his day. He puts this woman at risk of becoming Pharaoh's wife, one of his wives, and giving birth to a heathen child. What a horrible risk that he put you. So many people are hurt when a husband or wife is not walking in faith, but walking according to their own mind and their own will, doing things their own way. It's the same with the man or woman who's trying to establish their own righteousness. Rather than walk and receiving the righteousness of Christ by faith, trying to work and, and in their efforts to try to be holy in their own strength, people are hurt everywhere. Their standards are imposed on everybody. Anyone else that's not living according to this standard, they're going to be walked over and choked and hurt and preached at. Right. Do you know, God plagued Pharaoh's harem in his house in such a way that he had to get to the bottom of it somehow. They must have gotten it out of Sarai. They must have gotten it out of Abram. Somehow they got the word. It's because you have a woman of God, Jehovah God, and she's the cause of this. Abram is called on the carpet and said, Why didn't you tell us that this was your wife? And he commanded his soldiers to take this man and this woman to the border. And they were unceremoniously cast out of the land. And I want you to know that the testimony of this man was absolutely ruined. What kind of a God is this allows you to lie and put your wife at risk? Can you imagine what David did, how he put to risk the honor of God? How all of those in Gath are saying, what kind of God that takes his heroes and after he's finished with them, turns them over to madness? And folks, that's what happens when we walk in the flesh trying to achieve our own righteousness. What kind of a God is this that a man can talk about holiness and try so hard and be so mean? Nobody meaner than anybody, than anybody, than one who's trying to establish his own righteousness his own way. Outwardly, everything's fine, but inside, don't cross him, don't cross him. You'll find he got a temper. Or her. Whatever it may be. You remember how Jacob manipulates? And look at the hurt he causes. He, he is cast off, he's cut off from his dying father. His brother is driven to bitterness. And Rebecca is robbed for 20 years of the fellowship of both sons. 
She never lived to see her. She didn't see her grandchildren raised. She wasn't there with her grandchildren. Oh, she paid a price. We hurt so many people. There's so many, so much damage done when we get out of the will of God and when we're not walking in faith. And I've told you, and with this I'm going to close. I told you that we learn faith through failure. I learn faith by making a fool out of myself. And sometimes God will let you make a fool out of yourself when you're walking in flesh. I should have gotten permission to tell this story. But by the time the tape gets there, I can get to my daughters and sweet talk them. <laughs> get excused. I've got two daughters married well. Wonderful husbands. A number of years ago, before they were married, I, I told all my children when even they were late teens, I said, you don't ever have to try to scheme or manipulate to find your mate. I said, all you do is serve the Lord with all your heart, walk in obedience, trust the Lord, walk in his righteousness, and God will cause them to cross your path. They'll be there. Don't manipulate or you're going to get in trouble and you'll wind up marrying a bum. <laughs> Those are my very words. <laughs> One of my daughters, uh, in in her twenties, the first two or three years in her twenties, had, had a couple heartbreaks. <clears throat> Some young men that. She thought we're nice and, and uh, they didn't get along and <clears throat> she just had some heartbreaks. And she came to me once, Dad said, tell me again, Dad, about this way, you know, just trust God and he'll cross your path. Tell me about that again. <laughs> I said, honey, I believe it. I believe with all my heart that if you'll just trust God. Don't take matters in your own hand. Don't try to make anything happen. God will bring him. God's already got him. God's training him. You just hold on. And the next year or so, she met a young man. Nice looking young fellow. <clears throat> and I'd see him walking, holding hands. And and uh, time went by and I said, honey, is that, does he love you? She, she said, well, he... He makes me think he does. He tells me he's very fond of me. And I said, well, it's going awful slow. <laughs> and uh, here, here's a man walking by faith. Righteous before in his, in his, in his righteousness, praying, seeking God, and preaching this strong message. And I'm just about to be led into my severe wilderness. I mean, famine. God's going to bring me to a test. So, uh, time went on and I, I, I thought to myself, it's going to be a heartbreak. This, this, this kid doesn't know how to make a commitment. He needs some help. <laughs> in a few weeks, I had to leave for a crusade, some crusades in Europe. And I, I turned to one of my, da my daughter. I said, honey, why don't you and your friend come along to Europe for 10 days while I'm preaching crusades and, and, uh, just fellowship. I'll, uh, he can sleep in my room and I'll get you and our friend in another room. Or, I don't know if Gwen was there or not, but uh, they agreed. Oh, he jumped at it. Great. <laughs> Who wouldn't jump an all expense trip 10 days to. I'm sorry, I gotta tell this. <laughs> and all you people laugh and have done some stupid things just like I've done. <laughs> A week before we left, I went out and bought an engagement ring. <laughs> yeah. 
and on the way to Europe, I managed to put him on the seat next to me. And halfway over the Atlantic, I, I said, you know, I, I've seen you've been with my daughter for about six months, and you seem to be very close. And I know she likes you, and Gwen and I like you. And here I do, I, I get absolutely in the flesh. I absolutely forgot faith. I abandoned faith completely. Now I'm walking in, I became a world-class manipulator. This thing in my pocket in a jewel box. And I took it out and put it on my side and I said, you know, I know you're a student, you don't have much money. And I, I know you like my daughter. And I, I, I said, I know what's in your heart. And I pulled it out and I opened it up and said, how do you like that? <laughs> a full carrot. I got it cheap. He said, wow. He said, who's that for? <laughs> he knew I was married. <laughs> I said, I'll tell you what, we've got two days in London. I'll tell you what I want you to do. I want you to take my daughter down by Big Ben. The big clock. It's romantic. I'll give you money for a nice meal. Put it on her finger. He said, what? <laughs> he looked at me with a funniest look. He said, I have no intention of marrying your daughter. He said, she's a wonderful girl. I have no intention. We're friends. I turned every color of the rainbow. And I looked at that stupid rock. I closed it, put it in my thing. You know, first thing I thought, you ungrateful, ungrateful. You're not worthy of my daughter anyhow. You talk about hurting somebody. I hurt my daughter when she heard about it. Oh, did I hurt her. I'll tell you what hurt just as bad for 10 days watching that boy eat $50 steaks. <laughs> he enjoyed it. He enjoyed every moment. I'm sitting there thinking, you dummy, you dummy. I had gotten out of God's will. I got in flesh. You know, I could have messed up two lives. It was dangerous. We laugh about it. It's, in a way, it's awful stupid and funny, but I learned a lesson. I'm not saying I won't have to learn it again, but I hope it's never that stupid. And sometimes we, God allows us to get into these messes that we say, look, I can't handle life. I can't handle these things. I can't manipulate. I can't do these things. Lord, I'm going to have to trust you. And he'll literally drive us into his arms that we would trust him and believe him. Hallelujah. Are you trying to manipulate? Are you trying to make things happen? You're saying, God, I, I don't see your hand. It's too slow. I guess I've heard wrong. No, 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 no. You haven't heard wrong. The just shall live by faith. Will you stand? <clears throat> by the way, my daughter's happily, happily married. <laughs> to the right man. Hallelujah. I just know there's some young man here wishing I had another daughter.
Brother Carter said something that we not send you out Sunday night. Downcast. I've never believed in making a joke out of the gospel. What I told you tonight was sincere from my heart. But I'm going to give an altar call tonight for people saying, Brother Wilkson, I'm in a situation now that I don't understand. I just don't understand it because I have set my heart to seek the Lord. I love Him. I believe I'm walking in the righteousness of Christ. And and I, I just can't figure this out. Now, it's not that you're mad at God, but say, I don't understand this. I'm in a tight place. I'm in a crisis in my life, and it's hurting me. I would like to pray for you. If you're here tonight without Jesus, if you're not, if you're here without the Lord, and especially if you're here right now saying, Brother Wilson, I'm trying to make something happen, and it's not working. It's not working. It may be in a relationship. It may be something else. If the Holy Ghost is talking to you, and even while we were laughing at what I was telling you as a true story, God was still dealing with something in your life about it, about your own foolish manipulation if what I preach was the word of the Lord, he'll speak to your heart up in the balcony, go to the stairs on either side and come down any aisle. Come on, uh, musicians, and help me. And, and Heavenly Father, right now I pray that you forgive us for not taking this leap of faith. God, nothing is impossible with you. You are able, you are absolutely able, Lord, to do what we can't conceive to be done. Lord, you'll make a way where there is no way. You'll do what we can't even conceive to be done. God, we're going to come now by faith to say, Lord, I'm going to put my life, my future, everything into your hands. God, I want to trust you with my life. Come as they sing. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart. If you're not right with God or backslidden, if you have, if you have something now that you've been trying to work out on your own, you say, I'm tired of it, Brother Dave. I'm tired of that. I'm going to give it over to the hands of the Lord. If, if you're going to come down the aisle, make sure you're ready to do that. Or don't come. Come only because you're ready to turn everything over to the hands of the Lord. Folks, first of all, let's deal with our unbelief. I want you to pray this with me right now. Jesus, forgive my unbelief. Forgive me for walking in the flesh. And trying to work things out by my own power and my own strength. Cleanse me, Lord, from my selfishness. Oh, Lord Jesus, blot out my sins, my fears. I come to you now, Lord, to yield my life and my all to you. Lord Jesus, put in my heart the faith to believe for the impossible, for the miraculous, because I need a miracle. How many of you need a miracle in your life? Raise your hand right now. Tell the Lord right now with your hand raised, Lord, I believe you're a God of miracles. Say it right now, Lord. I believe that you can give me a miracle. You can work out the impossible. Things look impossible, Lord. You can do it. Tell him, Lord, I know you can do it. You can do it, Lord. You can work out everything in my life. I believe you. I trust you. I believe in the miraculous. Lord, I take that leap of faith, believing that you will work out every problem that I face, every crisis. I will stand still and see the salvation of my God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We just give him thanks right now for his faithfulness, Lord. I give you thanks. I give you thanks. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Father, I pray for these that have come forward tonight. That you would drive out all unbelief. Lord, you will not fail one single person in this building that's reaching out to you. Not one. Lord, you see every crisis. You see every burden. You see every need. You see every hardship. Lord, you see every relationship that's strained. Every marriage that's in trouble. Lord, you know all about it, and you're a God of miracles. And until we believe that, until, Lord, you're convinced that we believe that, we have tied your hands. Lord, we, we untie your hands by saying, I do believe I receive now. 
the truth in my heart that God will not fail me. God cannot fail. He will not fail. Oh, folks, look at God wanting more than anything else is our simple childlike faith in his faith. Satisfied sinners. I'm thinking tonight of a young mother I used to see pushing a baby carriage up in Harlem. And it bothered me because she had black and blue marks on her. And she stopped me one day and said, aren't you the man working with drug addicts? I said, yes, ma'am. He said, then, sir, you've got to get to my husband, Hector. He's one of the worst drug pushers. He's a maniac. He beats me up. He abuses the baby. He's going to kill us. Please get to him. Now, we usually don't work like that. We prefer they get desperate and come to us for help. But out of pity for that mother, we went to Hector and told him about our program and said, when you get desperate, come and see me. And a few weeks later, in a point of desperation, Hector came. We took him into the program. It lasted eight months to a year. And while Hector was in the program, in a rehabilitation program, I'd see his wife, Carla, in the streets. And she'd say, how's Hector doing? I'd say, Carla, we're going to send a new man back to your home. He's going to be the father and husband he should be. He's going to have love in his heart. And friends, that's exactly what happened. Eight months later, we sent Hector home, a Bible under one arm and a box of candy under the other. And I'll tell you, it gave me joy to know that we were sending a young man home that wasn't a maniac. Now, he wasn't a drug daddy. He didn't smoke. He didn't drink. But more than that, he said he was going all the way with Christ. I felt so good about it. Two weeks later, I got the shock of my life. I was walking in a back alley, worked with some junkies, and there's Hector on the corner, on the curb, dirty, filthy, back on the needle, worse than ever. I was horrified said, Hector, what in the world happened to you? He said, why don't you go home and ask my wife, Carla? I said, what do you mean? He said, David, I went home determined I was going to live it. He said, but you know, I got home. My wife's a chain smoker, and it bothered me. I said, look, Carla, I, I can quit drugs and smoking. I can expect you to quit blowing smoke in my face. I want you to quit smoking, and I want you to quit running around with all those wicked housewives on the block of those parties, and I want you to quit drinking. She blew up at me, he said. He's she said, who in the world do you think you are? Why, you dirty, filthy sinner. You come in here now and get a little religion and come in here and start preaching at me. She said, you make me nervous. I don't like you like this. I like you better the way you were before. And boy, she started henpecking him and henpecking him for two weeks, trying to seduce him back to the needle and went out finally and bought two bags of heroin, threw it on the kitchen table with a set of work, said, shoot it up. I want you back the way you were. He said, David, I couldn't face it myself. I need help at home. I couldn't fight it alone. And to this day, I don't understand why a young housewife in Harlem prefers a drug addict crazed husband to a man of God. And yet, see, Carla was satisfied in her sins. The light that he'd received condemned her darkness and she'd have nothing to do with it. I'm thinking, too, of another uh, situation when I had heard of a young boy living like a dog in a basement. They described it to me, and I couldn't believe it. A 17-year-old boy whose parents had died when he was 12 years old, he'd run away because he didn't want the welfare department to put him in institution. He found an old tenement house, a dilapidated tenement house, and the superintendent let him sleep in the basement if he'd do some chores and take care of the furnace. And the boy was 17 years old when I found him, a heroin addict. And I went in the basement, a dark, dirty, rat and roach-infested basement, filthy, damp, and dark. And there in a the corner, he had it fixed up like a little room. He had a pile of rags that he slept on. He had a calendar on the wall that was two years old, a picture of his mother, and a candle. This was his room. I looked around, and there he was, sitting over in another corner, high as he could be. His eyeballs were yellow. He was full of hepatitis and jaundice. Seventeen years old, an animal. He hadn't bathed in months. He ate junk food, robbed and stole for money to support his habit. We picked that boy up. I couldn't believe that in America we had kids living like dogs. I picked him up. We put him in the car and took him to the center and cleaned him up. Uh, the cook got him a good hot meal. The first hot meal he'd had, I'm sure, in months. Took him into the chapel. Showed him what Christ had done for other junkies. He said, I want to try. And friends, that night at midnight, we put Manny to bed in new pajamas, beautiful clean sheets, nice downy soft pillow, and two boys to stay up with him all night to help him kick cold turkey, wipe the sweat from his brow to pray with him. 
And I'd been gone a few weeks and went down to my office after putting him in the room with the boys. And I was dictating some letters in the dictaphone machine. About two o'clock, I flipped it off and leaned back in the chair. And I thought of that boy up in that room. And I thought of boys like Nicky Cruz. And I thought, now, Lord, that's pure religion and undefiled. And there's nothing in the world that brings such a sense of, of, of fulfillment as to be a part of this wonderful scheme of God's grace. And I thought, oh, Lord, if, with all the problems, this makes it worth it all. And I conjured in my mind uh, maybe another Nicky Cruz sending him to college. And, and one day, a man of God walking back in the street and saying, there's where God found me. And I felt so good. About 2 o'clock, or 2.30 rather, I heard a blood-curdling scream. My office opened to the main lobby, and I went to the door just in time to see Manny running out the door, throwing on his clothes, screaming like a wild man. I chased him down the block. He went down the subway. A train arrived, and he went off into the night. I missed the train. Went back to the center and asked them what had happened. They said, we don't know. He, did. he was sleeping. He woke up. He grabbed his clothes, screaming, and ran. The next day... I went up to Harlem, into the basement. He wasn't there. I looked all over, all over five or six blocks and finally found him in a little cafe drinking a cup of coffee. He tried to run when he saw me. I said, Manny, look, why'd you run out on me? Come on, my car's out there. Let's get back. He said, no, sir. And I want you to leave me alone. He said, you did a terrible thing to me last night. I said, what do you mean? He said, listen, I don't have much left in life, but the little I've got left, you took away from me. And I, I thought of that calendar and a picture of his mother and, and uh, the candle. I thought, well, we could get that stuff if that's what he's relating to. He said, mister, and I'll never forget it, you took my security. I said, you're what? He said, my security. He said, that's just a, 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 a hole in the wall to you. But he said, for four years, that's been my home, and I've grown accustomed to it. And to tell you the truth, I like it. He said, I like shooting drugs. I like living in that basement. Don't you understand? I didn't want to go with you. I was sick. He said, you fed me, that's nice. You're being a good man, you're trying to help people, that's fine. But he said, I don't want your help, don't you understand? You put me in new pajamas, in a clean bed, I hadn't slept in a mattress for years. He said, I woke up, I was so miserable, I felt my body was crawling with worms. He said, I was miserable. He said, please, don't you understand? I'm satisfied, just the way things are. And I had to walk out after an hour. He wouldn't listen, I, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I got in a car and I shook my head and said, I don't believe it, how a kid can prefer a rat-infested basement to the love we were trying to give him. And the tragedy is, friends, and this is documented in one of my books. Manny died six months later in the Brooklyn Hospital, cirrhosis of the liver. And I've never forgotten his face. You see, to me, Manny and Carla represent a whole new breed of sinner that, that we are uh, breeding in America today. I call the satisfied sinner. You see, the way I interpret my Bible, there are only two kinds of sinners, sorry sinners and satisfied. Now, David sinned grievously against God, yet he said, I repent of my sins. I'm sorry. I'll forsake my wicked ways. That's godly sorrow that leads to repentance. But you see, we have a breed of sinner in America now who, who, who won't come to Christ because they have the idea in their mind that some strange, mysterious power has overwhelmed them and they can't help it. They are a victim. You see, have you ever heard this? The devil made me do it. I couldn't help it. This strange, mysterious power keeps pushing me on. I don't want to be like this, but I can't help it. And I've prayed about this, friends, and the Holy Spirit's been saying some things to me I want to, I want to say here tonight. First of all, there's no such thing as a victim of sin, only volunteers. Almost every drug addict that comes to us for help now has been to his local psychiatrist and he's had a perfect alibi given to him as to why he's a junkie. I had a 16-year-old kid come to me and I said, look, why does a 16-year-old kid stick a dirty needle in his vein? You're only 16 years old. You know better. He said, well, Mr. Wilson, I'll tell you, it's very traumatic. He said, my problem is I've got interpersonal relationships, intensified anxiety states, and sibling rivalries. I said, who told you that? He said, my psychiatrist. He said, you see, Mr. Wilson, I can't help uh, what I am. I, I'm a victim of poverty. He said, I got caught up in the poverty syndrome. You see, I'd have preferred to have been born out in a nice suburb where there was love and a couple cars in the garage, but I got stuck in this ghetto, and I can't help it. I didn't ask to be born down here. This is where I've been put. I can't help it. Can't you see? Society put this on me. 
And friend, I can take you. I'm not about to tell you that poverty and unemployment and the ghetto are not contributing factors to dragging a soul down. But I can take you to Harlem and show you kids sleeping in hell. Mom's a prostitute. Dad's a drug pusher. Brothers and sisters are all smashed and stoned on drugs. Yet that kid's a man of God. He's going to go to Bible school and preach the gospel in spite of his environment. And I can take you right here to Denver, some of the most influential suburbs, and show you beautiful $100,000 and $200,000 homes with three, four, and five cars in the driveway. And parents who love their kids and their kids going straight to hell in spite of their good environment. I'm a victim. Almost every man who, who cheats on his wife today and commits adultery becomes a fornicator. Instead of calling him by his right name, a fornicator and adulterer, we try to rationalize, we try to uh, dialogue with the problem and, and try to give him an excuse. And it goes something like this. Well, now, have you seen his wife? She's a witch. Well, if you were married to that, you'd run out and find somebody to understand you too. All the man wanted was somebody to understand him. And all the cheat in the world, and everybody says, all I want is somebody to understand me. Hogwash. Well, you city people don't know what that means. That's pig's food. I've been working with homosexuals for 20 years. We've had a home for homosexuals for 12 years now in upstate New York. A wonderful man of God delivered from homosexuality. Married now, a happy family man. And, and we baptized uh, this past year seven that have been delivered. And I believe that Christ is the cure, but friends, out of the thousands and thousands I've ministered to, only two out of a hundred have ever been reached or helped at all, because only two out of a hundred were willing to quit blaming somebody for their problem. Ask any homosexual, how did you become a homosexual? Mother did it. My mother did it. I had a mean father and I had a permissive, pampering mother. You just ask my psychiatrist, you tell you. Mm -hmm. It's almost a sin to be a parent today. Mother did it. Dad did it. My friends, this, this is all over the country now. Remember this mass homosexual murder down in Houston? 25 boys, little boys were murdered and buried in cellophane garbage bags. And I have a film clip of the police digging up those bodies. And they just captured young Henley boy who'd been a part of these murders and confessed it. And he's leaning over a police car talking on the phone to his mother. And before they even get the boy to jail, a psychiatrist is talking to reporters in Houston and saying, now this boy is a product of a permissive society. We all made him what he is. He couldn't really help it. Not a one word about the stacks of pornographic smut they found in the boy's room. Not one word of the fact that he was an alcoholic. And not one word of the fact that he'd been going to sex orgies for years. No, we made him what he was. You know, all the time I have parents come to me to ask me to visit their kids in jail. And very seldom do I get an honest parent who comes and says, David, my kid did wrong. He got in trouble. My boy's in jail. He's paying for his penalty, his crime. But I love him. Go visit him, please. Now, I respond to that kind of honesty. But you know what I get? Almost all the time. Brother Dave, please go visit my boy in jail. Or my boy wouldn't hurt a flea. So help me the persecuting him. It's a communist conspiracy. It's Watergate. That's what it is. I am so sick and tired of Watergate. You know, we've got a man sitting down in San Clemente that is acting like a second savior for the United States, and we're piled up all the national conscience on one man who's sitting there, and I'll tell you, friends, there are more hypocrites and there are more false prophets in Washington doing more now than Nixon ever did making him look like a Sunday school picnic. And I'm so sick and tired of everybody blaming everything on one man. I'm not a Nixon man, but I'm telling you, every time somebody wants to shade their own hanky-panky, Watergate! Now, friends, let me say it again. There are no victims of sin, only volunteers. My Bible says, remember the words of the apostles, how they warned you. Men should become lovers of pleasure, covetous, disobedient to parents, drawn away by the lust of their own hearts sensuous, separating themselves, having not the spirit, drawn away by the lust of their own heart, not by a pusher, not by a hooker, not by a Watergate, wicked politicians. Kids today who are smoking, drinking, running around and carousing and sticking needles in their veins are not running from somebody or something. They are following the lust and the dictates of their own heart. They're doing exactly what they want to do. The Bible said they're volunteers. 
drawn away by the lust of their own heart. They're sensuous. Americans have become sensuous. And the Bible said they separate themselves. Well, you go to a local high school party, you know what the Lord's talking about, how they separate themselves into their own little group. Why, well, I'm sure you don't go to high school parties, but I go wherever kids will listen. And you go to average high school uh, or college party today, and over here in one corner, all the potheads and the pillheads are all congregated, and they're all jiving on drugs. Now, you are jiving in this, you know, and, and the shades, and always, if they're on pills or a horse, they're pulling their nose and scratching their ears, and they're all jiving about drugs. See, they have a secret thing among them. They're all doing the same thing. They're all popping pills. They're sucking grass, and they're saying, hey, amen. I got me joint last night. Heavy, man. Heavy, heavy, heavy. Everything. Heavy man. And then over here in the other corner, all the six packers. Listen, you ask, you ask any high school kid in this place right now, the biggest thing in high school in Denver, Colorado, this state, the United States, is cruising and drinking, saving up money and get enough six packs and go cruising. You go down to your town, right down here now, tonight and tomorrow, hundreds and hundreds of cars, teenagers just going back and forth, Drinking cool beer and throwing the cans out the window. Hey, you hear kids saying, I'm dropping out of society. You know how the kids dropped out of society in 1976? In a $7,000 Dodge van with stereo. I wish I could drop out like that. Dropping out. Then over here in the other corner, all the spoochers and the petters. And they're looking around winking at anybody. You can always find your own kind. They're always around. And they connect. And they say, hey, this party's a drag that split. Get in the car, go to a local driving movie, crawl in the back seat and start making out. And that's exactly what the Bible says. They separate themselves. They're sensuous. They're drawn away by the lust of their own heart. And I've never been able to help anybody in 20 years until they say, this is my problem. And quit blaming somebody else and say, hey, look right in the mirror. In all honesty, say, this is a monkey on my back. I'm responsible. It's my problem. And quit blaming somebody else for what's happened to you. There's no strange power that's overwhelmed you. No, you're drawn away by the lust of your own heart. You're doing exactly what you want to do. Secondly, the satisfied sinner continues in his sin because he doesn't believe God will ever judge him. You see, he only sees the mercy side of Christ. Oh, how people love to go to church today and hear soft, easy preaching about thinking things through in a positive way. Everything is up, is coming, roses. And oh, how we love to hear about the sympathizing Jesus. Well, if I were a sinner and I had, if I had a hang up in my, I'd like to go to church and hear the preacher not jab me about my sin, but tell me how Jesus loves the sinner. And, and you see, that, that's a part of Christ. I've been preaching for 20 years up and down the streets of this nation around the world. I've been preaching mercy and love to sinners, prostitutes, charlots, and junkies. But friends, I know the other side. I know the goodness and the severity of God. But all there are a lot of sinners today like to hear how, how Jesus, see, they picture Jesus as the he-man who understands that everybody should have a little weakness in their heart. The man who forgives heart, that's right on the spot, who goes around quoting from David, if God marked iniquities among us could stand, he knows our frame, he remembers that we're dust. Oh, how they like to see Jesus driving the money changers or the establishment out of the temple. They like to picture Jesus going to parties, turning water into wine. And all the wine guzzlers in America quote that at me. And Jesus turned the water into wine. Mm -hmm. and that wasn't grape juice. That was wine. Mm. Oh, the world today likes to hear about the sympathizing Jesus as if to say, well, Jesus understands this weakness in me. He knows I've tried and I can't help myself. So when I get before the judgment bar of Christ, he's going to understand that because he's loving, he's patient. He came to seek and to save the lost. He, and I'm one of those sinners that had a portion of his grace, but he knows that I just can't handle this. And oh, how we love to see this sympathizing side of Jesus. But there's nothing in my Bible that says Christ came to coddle sin. He loved the sinner, but he said he came to call sinners to repentance. But you see, friends, we're creating a wrong image of God on the American conscience. We've created in our minds through preaching from backslidden pulpits and through our permissive way of life in America. We have created an image of God who is weak, who allows hanky-panky, who allows anything to go as long as you don't hurt anybody in the process. As long as it's a personal problem and you're not hurting somebody else, you can live with it. And so, consequently, most people say, well, everybody's got a hang-up. 
I don't understand the kind of preaching in America that allows American conscience to believe that God is putting up with what we're having in America. To allow what happened in Dallas, Texas this past summer. You may or may not know that there's an all-homosexual church in America called the Metropolitan Community Churches. They now claim over 50,000 members. They've made application to the World Council of Churches. And the tragedy is that the United Church of Christ two months ago at their General Assembly voted to accept homosexuals as ordained ministers in the United Church of Christ. Three major denominations now have established study committees with a dialogue with the homosexual churches in view of ordaining homosexual pastors. Well, first, they had their Holy Ghost Convention, they called it, in Dallas, Texas this past summer. 2,000 delegates. These are ministers from these churches and their delegates. They called it their Holy Ghost Annual Convention. Now, I couldn't go because they know what I stand for and they'd have kicked me out. So I sent my mother as an underground delegate. My mother is a great ordained minister of the gospel, and she loves people. She doesn't care whether you're homosexual or drug addict. She'll preach the same message in love. Now, friends, I believe in having compassion on homosexuals. I've preached that for years and more understanding of the church. But my message has always been as Christ is the cure, not an excuse. And that the church must never establish a dialogue with the doctrine of devils. But my mother brought back to me a tape recording of that convention. Now, I've never heard the hallelujah chorus sung with such enthusiasm. Power in the blood, I shall not be moved. And then to hear the evangelist stand and misquote from the, from the, from Romans. And you see, the indictment against the homosexual community has been Romans. And they changed that which is natural into unnatural desires and God gave them over to reprobate minds. But they say, that's not us. We didn't change anything. We were born this way. That can't be referring to us. That's someone else in society. And see how subtle the enemy is? Say, that's not you. You were born. You couldn't help it. You were created. You were a victim. So this does not point at you. And to hear the misquote, and I heard them say, God has delivered this generation to do as they please. You can be a homosexual. Come out of your closet and worship the Lord. You can talk in tongues. You can do anything and remain as a homosexual. And the thing that bothers me, friends, my mother laid on my desk blushing the registration packet she got. And every delegate got the same pack she got, 2,000 of them. You know what was in that packet? This blows my mind. Uh, the course sheet and uh, program and two all-nude magazines of nude men and a list of all the gay bars in Dallas, Texas, so that after the meeting you could go out and get drunk and connect. These are ministers. You see, Fred, what has happened to American conscience, this kind of hypocrisy, we, be, we, are, we, we believe that God's going to let us get away with this, that we're on some fortress island, and God, when we reach the last point, that homosexuals is in Sodom, what that which is sacred and holy, that we can get by with it. And we've created in our consciousness in America the fact that God is so weak, he'll not deal with sin anymore. There's another kind of hypocrisy, friend, that I don't understand. And these are parents who put their kids down for smoking pot, and they smoke one lucky strike after another. You know, there'll be a, uh, a story in the local newspaper about a drug bust in a local school, and here's dad and mom. They just had supper, and after supper, out comes the cocktail, and out come the cigarettes and the coffee. And they're all lit up, you know, and half stoned. And it goes something like this. Hey, honey, Puff, did you see Puff that thing in the paper, Puff, those crazy kids in high school, Puff, blowing that pot stuff, Puff? That dirty, filthy commies, Puff. What in the world does this world come to, Puff? We never did that, Puff, when we were kids, Puff. Puff. So we never did that, man. What's the world coming to? Those crazy kids, Puff. Suck. Now, I watched some of you people coming in here tonight. You couldn't come in and listen to me for one hour till you lit up your cigarette. And you're sitting here now with a pack in your pocket or purse, and you're sitting here like a worm in a bucket of hot ashes, and you'd smoke right now if I'd let you. And you can't wait to get out of here, and you people who smoke are as hooked as any drug addict I've ever worked with. I, I would, and, and tell you, something else, hold, hold it please. You know, some, something else that bothers me, something that really bothers me, I call them puffin' prophets. Preachers who stand in the pulpit and say, kids, don't smoke pot, don't use drugs, Jesus can keep you clean. And those poor kids sit there scratching their heads and then so why can't he keep you clean? I was in a crusade recently and I noticed the chairman going, Lord, Lord, in his seat. I didn't know he smoked. 
He said, you sure got me in trouble last night preaching like that. My two teenage sons went home and threw all my pipes in the fireplace. I said, I tell you, he's, your kids are trying to say something for you. You may not think smoking or drinking is sinful. Well, we do. You want us to quit smoking pot? We want you to quit smoking cigarettes. What you're sucking is just liquid pot anyhow. And what we need in America is a good old-fashioned Holy Ghost mouthwash. That's right. We need parents who will quit being such hypocrites. All the hypocrisy of the American system. Now, I reach it everywhere. It's almost impossible for me to preach against drugs in the colleges and high school campuses because of parental and pastoral hypocrisy anymore. The kids will come back to me. You know, the United States government, for example, has one agency that says you can't advertise cigarettes on television anymore and you advertise right on the packet. Surgeon General's determined smoking to be harmful to your health. Isn't that nice? Agency of our government saying don't smoke, it'll kill you. And another agency of the same federal government last year spent $133 million buying cigarettes for Food for Peace projects to send our cancer by the cart overseas. How do you like that for double standards? How about the school district in Mississippi a few months ago put out a rule that no high school kids could smoke on the campus for the whole district and the third morning they could be expelled. You know the hypocrisy of all? They had just spent 30000 for a smoking lounge for the teachers. Hypocrisy! No wonder our kids don't listen. I say this, if you want to smoke and drink, that's between you and God, but you've abdicated your right to preach morals to your kids. Mm-hmm. But that be a pipe of smoke. Sure glad I got my offering. Now, look, friends, I'm not trying to be cute. I mean it with all my heart. I would tell you another kind of hypocrisy. All you people sitting there saying, give it to them, baby. Yeah, those smokers, no drinkers. I got something for you. And talk about television. Now, I know some of the old boy, he's a clothesline preacher. Now, he's one of those holiness preachers. Since when's holiness a dirty word? Now, friends, I don't believe in our, I believe in the imputed righteousness of Christ. I believe that when Christ comes into my life, he becomes my righteousness. He is my holiness. He does not put in me a seed of holiness. He is the holiness. He does not try to extract holiness from me. He has become my holiness and my righteousness, my justification, my sanctification. He's become all the fullness of the Godhead through Christ. But friends, I don't understand the hypocrisy. I've been warning American people now since 1973 when I put out a book called The Vision. I warned of a flood of filth in America. I warned of a flood of filth. Did you see this week's cover of Time Magazine? The porno plague in America. I read it and wept. I've never read anything so powerful in my life. How America, and these are liberals who said, we don't understand what's happened. These are liberal, most liberal minds saying, this is not turning out the way we thought it would. In 1973, I warned American people that there was going to be a baptism of filth on America. And I saw the prophecy of the prophet Nahum coming to pass. Behold, saith God, I will pour abominable filth upon you. That doesn't mean that God has a reservoir of smut and filth stored up. No, the devil does, and the Holy Ghost has been the floodgates holding it back, restraining it. But now the restraining ministry of the Holy Spirit is being lifted because the world is clamoring for nudity and perversion and filth and smut and, and perversion. And God says, all right, that's what you want. That's what you'll get. You're going to be baptized with it. I warned Americans that there was a ship in a New York harbor with $10 million dollars was the worst smut to ever come out of Copenhagen. That's already just flooding the United States market. I warned that on television, after midnight, on cable, we'd have X-rated movies. Fifteen American cities now have X-rated movies. New York City is called the Blue, uh, the Blue Service, Blue Series. They have the same Blue Series up in Toronto. They have it in uh, 14 American cities now. Recently, the Devil Miss Jones and Deep Throat played on, on cable on a number of cities in America through college campuses. I had been warning Americans that we'd have full nudity on primetime television. Three weeks ago, NBC had their first full-time nudity and toplessness, and they called it a medical nudity. You see, they're coming in. It's called medical nudity, how to discover uh, cancer. And this was the first trial balloon, and now, friends, it's just opening an avalanche. And, friends, I've been saying all along that we were going to have programs that were programmed right in the pits of hell, and that programs like MOD... All the family, Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, would compete with one another 
to put down everything that's sacred and holy and mock everything that's righteous. And the devil would like nothing better for American people to sit in their living rooms and laugh and mock at everything that's sacred and holy. You know what they're talking about now. They're talking about all kinds of subjects that we want to do. And now anything goes. Cursing. Uh, I, I was supposed to be in Los Angeles a few weeks ago for the burial of Miss Catherine Coleman on Tuesday. And I couldn't make it. I had the flu. And someone called me. I was at home resting. And someone called me. Said, Mr. Wilson, please turn on Channel 5 right now. Now on Channel 5 at 3.30, there's a program called Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, the plays. And I turned it on. I couldn't believe it. They were mocking Catherine Coleman. There was a healer who was laying hands on somebody in a wheelchair, and the lady fell right out, and they did everything but name Catherine Coleman. And I, I, I wanted to scream because the irony of it is that that very hour they were burying Catherine Coleman. I said, God, the devil won't even let her get in the ground. On the Johnny Carson show, David Fry, the comedian, has learned to mimic Billy Graham. And at the end of his presentation, he got his hands and knees, looked right in the camera, and said, please send me all your money for my books and records and sermons. I want to be a millionaire. And the crowd went crazy, stomping. And Carson said, that's really funny. You see, if the devil can get us to laugh and to mock a spirit of mirth and frivolity. There was an earthquake the other day. I, I was in that earthquake that hit up there. We were in, in Kentucky last week when that five-state earthquake hit. I was on the 11th floor and the building began to sway. And friends, it was a, a terrible experience. And especially that night, I was preaching on the judgment on America and how uh, the massive earthquakes are going to start coming. First, smaller than massive earthquakes. And you know the thing that really bothered me? I, I was going through uh, Memphis where the earthquake had really hit hard. And on the front page of the commercial appeal, there's a whole section earthquake jokes. They were joking about it. You see, this is the very thing that I'm talking about. David said, the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. Because I don't understand how any Christian can even watch a program like Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman. I saw just that episode and a few flashes of two or three others. I said, my God, I can't even look at that. I don't understand some Christian ladies being so addicted to things like as the world turns. I had a, a preacher's wife recently say, Mr. Wilson, I had to quit for one reason. I found myself applauding, sitting there, urging on in my spirit and applauding divorce and filth. She said, I kept saying, leave him. Run away from him. She said, I found myself applauding and partaking vicariously. Watch. You say, oh boy, now we've got one of those preachers here who's going to preach against coffee next. I'm talking about the hypocrisy of it. And it goes something like this. There'll be a dirty, filthy movie coming on CBS. And the wife's in getting the coffee pot ready. And the husband's in there and he turns it on. And all of a sudden, there's the promo advertising the film. And there's a filthy scene. And it goes something like, hey, Mabel, quick, quick, quick. You'll never believe what's on television. Hurry, hurry, hurry. And so they sit there and say, My Lord, isn't that awful? What have we, just like Brother Dave said, isn't that awful? And for two hours they sit there watching the whole thing and say, Isn't that awful? What are we coming to? Oh, God, help me. Isn't that awful? Look, isn't that awful? And watch the whole brewing thing. Well, if it bothers you, and if it convicts you, turn it off. Don't be a hypocrite. And I'll tell you something else, friends. I'm not afraid of this baptism of smut. My Bible has a promise for every God-fearing man and woman that's built his house on the rock. If your house is in Christ and you believe Christ, there's a little knob there. It says off and on. And you're going to have to practice a little discretion from now on because you're being programmed right from hell now. You hear me? It's coming right out of the pits of hell. And you've only seen the beginning. They're going to start taking God's name in vain. Within the next three months, you're going to hear God's name taken in vain in major uh, prime time. God's name in vain now. Four-letter words. Absolute hell breaking loose in our TV twos. But thank God there's a promise for every Christian. Dad, Mom, you don't have to be afraid if all hell breaks loose. I don't care if all the demons in the hell are unleashed. I don't care if hell does enlarge its borders. My Bible said the man built his house upon the rock. And the floods came. 
the floods of filth and smut and pornography and perversion and could not shake that house because it was on the rock. Thirdly, something the Lord has shown me is that the satisfied sinner is on the verge of committing a sin that is worse than the unpardonable sin. I'm going to preach something you've never heard in your life. I think it's worse than pardonable sin because it's self-inflicted. And it's more tragic than pardonable sin because God is willing to forgive, but man removes himself from God's reach. And it's called a reprobate mind. A reprobate mind. And because they refuse to retain the knowledge of God, therefore God gave them over to a reprobate mind. A reprobate mind. Three places in the Bible. And God gave them over to the wickedness. God gave them up to their uncleanness. God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Do you know what a reprobate mind is? Have you ever met somebody with a reprobate mind? A reprobate mind is a mind that is sold out to a lie. A mind who has been telling itself a lie for so long it begins to accept that lie is the truth. And for this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie and may be damned to believe not the truth. Given over to a lie. Oh, how many people I have met that have been given over to a lie. I was at a crusade down in Newport News, Virginia, and a 15-year-old lad, about six feet tall, came, a nice-looking kid. He was a drug pusher, and he needed help, so I took him to my ranch in Texas. And I had a, a five-hour counseling session with him one day, and I said, Bruce, why did you come forward crying like that in my meeting? He said, sir, you were talking about a reprobate mind. And he said, Oh, boy, did that hit me. He said, when I was 12 years old, I ran away from home and started selling pot and grass to my friends. And, and for years, I was condemned about it. I thought, I'm ruining the lives of these kids. I'm messing up their minds. He said, but six months ago, the devil planted a little thought in my mind, just a little lie. Bruce, don't condemn yourself anymore. You're not hurting anybody. Don't you know that these kids are being helped through your drugs? Don't you know kids are seeing visions of God? They're getting scared of the devil? Don't you know that they're, they're becoming God conscious through drugs? You are a drug evangelist. You can go out and sell all you want from now on and congratulate yourself. You're doing as much good as any preacher. He said, David, I started going out selling drugs freely. No condemnation. And when I came to your meeting, I was convinced that God had called me, that my whole call in life was to go around selling drugs, opening kids' minds so they could have psychedelic revolutions and see God and angels and demons through drugs. He said, and I was almost convinced that that was my call in life. The reason I was put on this earth was to be a drug evangelist. He said, now that may seem crazy to you, but he said, I was believing that lie. And when you talked about being turned over to a lie, the Holy Spirit rebuked me for that. He said, the fear of God came on me and I ran down the aisle trembling. He said, David, if I hadn't come forward to your meeting, I'd have gone out and sold myself to this lie. I'd have been busted. That had set me up for 30, 40 years, and I'd have been spending 30, 40 years sitting in prison saying, why? I didn't do a bit of harm. I was just helping. And he said, I tremble to think that I almost sold out to that lie. I was believing that lie was the truth. My wife and I counseled a young 19-year-old girl who fell in love with a married doctor in her city. He had three lovely children and a beautiful wife. And this girl said she was losing her mind. She said, I can't eat or sleep. This is tearing me apart. I love this man. I believe that God brought us together, but I don't want to hurt his wife, and I don't want to hurt those three precious little children. He, she said, and I don't know what to do. She said, I love him. She said, I, I love him so much. And we get together, and we pray and read our Bible, and I know that I minister to his spiritual needs. And she said, I, I know God brought us together. I understand him. His wife doesn't understand him, and I do. What am I going to do? My wife and I sat there for two hours showing her from the scriptures she was living in adultery and fornication, that God would never appease it, that it was of hell, that she was being given over to a lie. And after two years, or two, two hours of preaching to her, when it was all done, we started to realize she hadn't heard a word we said. Because she said, I don't care what you say. Somehow, I believe God brought us together, and he's going to make it possible for us to stay together. What he, she was actually saying, I hope his wife dies so I can get it. That girl's going to wind up in a mental institution. She's given over to a lie. Nobody can reach her. Nobody can touch her. Her mind is shut. I met the worst reprobated minds in my life down in Mexico City. I went down for some crusades in the bullfight arena down in Mexico City a few years ago. And something powerful happened. See, in Mexico City, they have one of the world's biggest prisons. The Lucumberry Prison has over 5,000 inmates. 
And in the inner section, the security section, they have a security section with over 200 murders and rapists. And about eight, nine years ago, a Baptist missionary had distributed hundreds of my books across the Swiss Blade throughout the prison. And of all things, a revival broke out in the section where the murders and rapists were and 26 got saved. And one of them took a correspondence, the Brian Bible study course, and became a licensed minister. Well, when they found out I was in Mexico City for crusades, they asked me to bring the crusade into the jail. So I was happy to go. I didn't know all the story. I went through all these security gates, and the guard was saying, hey, man, where are you going? I said, the central security. He said, man, they got murders and rapists in there. I said, I know that's where the revival is. He almost had a coronary. He didn't know what I was talking about. I walked inside that last gate. They slammed it shut. Twenty-six men lined up. The pastor, Brother Delgado, about that tall Mexican in his mid-forties, I imagine, a Bible under his arm, smiled mirror to ear. Praise the Lord, Brother Dave. I got read, I got saved reading your book, The Cross and Switchblade. I'm pastor of the church. Luke and Barry, Berean Church. I want you to meet my associate pastor. These are my deacons. This is my mission secretary. These are my elders. Had a whole thriving church inside that prison. They, they put a table out in the courtyard and asked me to preach. I preached my heart out for half an hour. They gave an invitation. And I was heartbroken. Only five, six men came forward. I went around later. I stayed an hour or two to talk to the, these fellows. I never heard such reprobated foolishness in my life. One said, we don't need a preacher. We need a good lawyer. And every one of those men, they're going to die there. There's no way they're ever going to get out there for life or murder, rape, and all kinds of armed robberies and things. And you know what everyone said? Well, we're going to get out of here. They thought either Castro would invade Cuba or, or would invade Mexico and set them free or because they're in an earthquake zone, an earthquake could knock the walls down or their case would be reviewed and, and they would be released. One man in his 60s, I'm getting out of here and they're going to die there. Yet they're kept together by this lie. They live on a lie. Their minds completely closed to any message outside of that little lie given over to it. I was in Florida, just finished the meeting, got in my car to go to the motel and to knock on the window. I rolled it down. An 80-year-old man stuck his head in the window. He said, hi, David, I'm Joe. I said, Joe, am I supposed to know you? He said, yeah, Harkins Market, Braddock, Pennsylvania. Well, when I was a kid, 15 years old, I worked at a Harkins Market in Braddock near Pittsburgh. And there was a man by the name of Joe who lived on the block who used to shop there. And I used to preach at him every time he came in. He said, that's me. I retired and moved to Florida. He said, you know, David, I'm supposed to be dead. I had a terrible heart condition, and they did open heart surgery, took a vein out of my leg and put it in my heart. I've had a new lease on life. I said, Joe, were you in my meeting tonight? He said, yeah, and you preached at me again. I said, oh, you got saved. You came here to tell me. He said, no, sir. I said, Joe, I preached at you when I was 15 years old, years ago. And now I come full circle, and I'm preaching crusades, and I come to your city, and you come to hear me preach. And there was enough conviction there tonight that you could touch it and feel it. And you didn't come forward? No, sir. I said, Joe, you should be dead in hell now, and you know it. Yes, sir. Are you ever, before you die, are you ever going to make Jesus Lord of your life? No, sir. I said, I got a couple old phony friends and we drink a little and play cards and he said I got a philosophy at the end everything works out I'm not like those kids you preach to he said I'm no junkie I don't hurt anybody I don't kill nobody he said, I'm going to make it don't worry about me that mind's going to die and go to hell and he's closed out he just sit there while I preached amused just amused oh how this hurts me I can go up into Harlem and I can preach to prostitutes and alcoholics and they run to Christ and I can go to churches where there are good nicks I call them goodniks and smuggies. And they sit there smug in their sin. They've sat through 10,000 Jesus songs. They've heard a 1,000 Holy Ghost messages. They've walked out of a 1,000 Holy Ghost invitations. And they've grown hard in their hearts. And they're being given over to a reprobate mind. Now, if you sit here tonight and the Holy Ghost begins to prick your heart and you feel uneasy and you feel a pulling and a tugging, you can thank God that's the Holy Spirit still, still dealing and striving with your heart. But if you sit here tonight saying, well, nothing moves me, I feel absolutely nothing, I would say you're on dangerous ground because the Holy Spirit's here tonight. The Holy Spirit is here to save and the Holy Spirit's here to heal and change your life. Well, I, I believe this with all my heart. The coming of Jesus is right at the door. 
Some people call that the rapture. Now that term's not in the Bible. Some people call it the capture. That's not in the Bible either. So mine's just as good. I call it the evacuation. He's going to evacuate all the Jesus people in the twinkling of an eye. And friends, I believe that that moment's coming down upon us so fast. I believe it's right at the door. The Bible said right at the door. There's just a thin tissue between time and eternity. And friends, I don't understand how people, with this I'm going to close, I don't understand people who can sit in a meeting like this and stay satisfied with the way they are. The hardest people in the world to reach are those that are married and settled and, and, and they're at ease. And, and uh, they're good church people and they're good society members. And, and uh, they come to meetings like this and, and they hear me preach and they say, hey, that's all wrong. Or others will be convicted of their sin and my associates will come and say, David, you should have been out in the foyer as people were walking. Some of them were ash and white. Some of them were leaning on their friends and they go out in the cool air and shake off the conviction. I see it. I see it everywhere. And if I had my way, I would go up and down every aisle tonight, one by one, toe to toe, eye to eye with everybody in this building, up in the balcony behind me. And I'd point a finger with love right in your heart and say, are you really ready? Are you ready now? You know in your heart, God's put it in your heart. You know that the end of all things are near. You know that the thing is coming upon us now we've been preaching about for years. And yet people get up and walk out. I don't understand that. I don't understand that. I go home at night and I cry at my motel room and say, oh God, I preach my heart out. There were people there living in their sin. Hypocrites, phonies, 95 percenters who've given Jesus 95 percent, but they've been holding back. They've been cheating on God. And friends, one of these days, the Bible said every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, and every eye shall behold it. You and I are going to stand before God. We answer for the message we hear. And I, I'm on a life and death mission now. I don't care what anybody thinks of my preaching. I've got nothing left to prove. I have absolutely nothing to prove. I've got no ladder to climb. I've got a pulpit always waiting for me on the streets. I'm here to tell you right now, the Holy Spirit is...